Pony 2012 was not a campaign that aimed to promote a graduate level of knowledge about Uganda and the ICC. It was rather a campaign that compelled Western civilians to overcome their traditional apathy towards charity's approach to promoting that awareness about Africa's problems, and in the end, inspired people to actually take real action that can benefit those problems and fix those issues. That's why we support it and other campaigns in this debate. Two questions. First, why is it important that Western charities launch these campaigns? And second, why is it that simplistic and emotive campaigns are the most effective type of campaign? But first, let's be really clear what we're standing for in this debate. I assume that most people in this room have seen Coney or have heard the 14-year-old girls put it up on your Facebook screen. That's the kind of video we support, the kind of video that aims to promote a simple understanding of those issues and, and to promote that in the most emotive way possible. Okay, cool. First question, why is it important that Western charities launch these campaigns? The first thing to note is the level of apathy that often exists in Western publics towards the problems of Africa and the Third World. That's because of the lack of proximity to those problems and the lack of understanding that that proximity obviously infuse people with. It's also because of a sense of being overwhelmed by those problems, that the sheer scale of them is just too much for us to understand, let alone do anything about. Second question, why is it that charity's focus before Cody hasn't been working? Three reasons. Firstly, because they were not gripping the publics of, of Western nations. That's because they lacked the kind of emotive peel that, that campaigns like Coney have. They were focused on esoteric discussions of the kind of issues that, that were abundant in places like Uganda. But that's not what grips people's interest, and it's not what compels people to action. Second reason why those campaigns weren't working is because of their attempt to demonstrate the sheer scale and complexity of that problem. What that meant was, the, was that we had a media sphere that was overly filled with overcomplicated problems, which meant that that only compounded Western citizens' sense of being overwhelmed, of those problems having a scale just too big to fix. Third reason is because any of the harms of the misallocation of funds that they may want to tell you about existed previously to Pony and will continue to exist in things like the organisation World Vision. And Caitlin's going to tell you at second why it is that campaigns like Coney and the Awareness they support actually move towards a further regulation of that allocation of funds within those organisations and, uh, and in the end improve the efficacy of them. Right, so why is it that the Coney type of awareness is needed? Because we prefer a broad-based, passionately but simplistically informed population to a smaller, maybe more deeply informed, but a population that, in the end, debates itself into inaction about those problems. Right. So we think the Western campaigns, the, the Western charities, need to launch those campaigns. But then, why are those campaigns effective? Right. First question under this second issue. Why is it that simplistic, emotive campaigns are particularly good at raising awareness? Three, three reasons. Firstly, is because of the large amount of support that those campaigns can garner. Because people actually generally want to watch them. Because they don't provide that information in too much of a documentary, hard-hitting, very like heavy on the material form, but rather, like a, say a New York Times article may, but rather provide that information in an emotive, simple format that people from a diverse range of educations and socioeconomic statuses could access and emote with. Second reason is because the emotive pull of videos like Coney reduces the sense of distance and disconnect between Western citizens and their African suffering counterparts. We think that reducing that distance is particularly important when reducing that distance also means that you create awareness and that awareness leads to change, as I'm going to be talking about. Third reason why those simplistic emotive campaigns are best is because they are often the first step towards further knowledge and further research. So after watching Coney, you may feel more inspired to say go to a This Is Africa blog or read that New York Times article which you were previously uh, a little bit iffy about delving into because you understand broadly what those issues are about and have a simple understanding of the situation on the ground, which is a good launching pad to further understand those issues and further increase your awareness. Right, 
So we think that simplistic emotive campaigns ultimately have universal appeal, where other mechanisms uh, that the NEG may stand for in this debate just don't. Okay, so why is that awareness good? Five reasons. Firstly, is because indiv individual financial donations are crucial to the effective functioning of these Western charities. So part of, say, invisible children's work is in Africa. And if individuals can provide funds to those organisations which understand the issues facing Uganda and issues around Joseph Kony, far more than that citizen does, then those organisations can allocate those funds in the most effective way to deal with those problems on the ground. So financial don donations is the first reason why awareness is good. Secondly, is the ability of Western civilians to uh, influence their governments in ways that is ultimately in Africa and other poor countries' best interests. So we saw that when uh, Muammar Gaddafi's army was moving in on Benghazi, the kind of outcry that came from Western citizens as they saw that information in emotive ways, and the kind of uh, like outcry that inspired for those governments to intervene and protect the civilians of Benghazi who are about to, to come under siege. So we think that it can influence governments. Thirdly, it increases the media coverage of those issues. Media companies are corporations and ultimately have to suit, like, have to promote issues and show footage of the things that their customers want to see. So for instance, if a lot of people are interested in Joseph Kony, it is far more likely that CNN takes a camera to Uganda or the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's also far more likely that the New York Times opens a bureau within, say, 1,000 kilometers of Uganda and begins reporting on those issues which they need to. Fourth reason is that people are more compelled towards action when they feel emotionally connected to the people there. So for instance, when we saw Jacob in that Kony video, there were people who felt a strong emotional attachment to him and wanted to help him. That's not only helpful in that all my three reasons are compounded in terms of the amount of support that people have for them, but also those people who felt particularly strongly may choose to work on those campaigns. We have a cyclical process of awareness where those people join that campaign and can promote further awareness and, and get more people into that broad-based support. Final reason is that the responses to somewhat simple facts in those videos begin to come out and people read them. So for instance, on my Facebook news feed, there was an, an Oxford debater, who I think is Daniel Swain's boyfriend, name dropping, whatever, <laughs> who, who posted a fantastic blog on, on the This Is Africa site about the, the misrepresentation, perhaps, of that, of that video. And I read that blog, and many people did, and they began to understand those issues where they wouldn't have otherwise read about them. So hear, hear me all you want, that point falls to us. Thank you. So ultimately, <laughs> we have a choice in this debate between emotionally attaching ourselves with Jacob and having an understanding of his situation, and ultimately working towards saving him, or doing nothing and further debating ourselves into inaction, which is what the negative team is about to stand up and talk to you about. by like the intelligentsia of the world and told to be an absolute farce. 
Where are invisible children now? Literally invisible. <laughs> that is because that campaign was not centered on facts. So what do we stand for on this side of the house? We stand for real change. For organizations like the Paris-based Human Rights Watch, Teach for Australia, who we all love and know, and this is national. Basing like these campaigns on like video and social networking on actual facts and canvassing real policy options. They're aiming for people to like who can actually like create change. People like governments, people like think tanks that can actually have connections and create real international relations change. Yeah, they don't have universal appeal, but they appeal to the people who can help and can have change. I have three main areas that I'm going to discuss today, and in true Monash style, I'm going to integrate my bottle. <laughs> On to this first point about why facts and emotion are mutually exclusive in their campaigns. The opposition didn't really want to engage with the Coney 2012 campaign because what it did was it used emotions to tug at heartstrings and not much else. What it eventually told you was this guy getting his four year old son to say that Coney is a bad guy. I can picture like video games that he plays and watches like on ABC Kids. This wasn't emotion, this was emotion rather, but it wasn't logic. Why can't you do both at the same time? There are three main reasons why you can't give people factual information that they actually need while focusing on these kind of campaign plans. Firstly, because the style of emotion that you necessarily like, contract yourself into when you commit to these campaigns is a narrative structure. It focuses on one victim, focuses, focuses on case studies, and avoids like the biggest scale of problems. It avoids telling you like what Uganda's role in like you know the world politics over the last you know few like few decades has been, and where they actually place in international relations now. These are things you need to know if you actually want to have real policy options. Second reason why you can't do both. It's because you have time constraints. Yeah, Coney 2012 was fairly long, but these people have limited air time when they want to convince populations and convince people who can actually make a difference. You can't have like many different campaigns. You need one effective one, and we premise that's based on facts. Third reason, it's about who you hire to make these videos. Like Coney 2012 asked showmen and people who are really good with like graphics to make their campaign. We want you to hire like international relations experts who are smart and know the facts and can give people real options and real situations that they can do. Onto this idea that like people are too dumb to like you know recognize the facts and engage with like real policy issues. We actually question the premise today that you need like mass public support to affect change in like areas like Ugandan politics to like, you know cure world hunger and things like this. What you actually need is not just like general support. You need real government action. How do you get this? To the extent that the government is swung by the populace, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. That happens to an extent, but it's also very indirect, and it relies on the government's interest being like allied to the thing that the people also want, which isn't always the case. We also think that what you should be doing is like going straight to the government. Like if you want to be direct, you convince the government, not just the people who might convince the government. You go straight to the point. The idea with fact-based campaigns is we think like we have some really like exe excellent examples of them. The opposition wanted to tell you that the problem today was just like a lack of apathy. Fixing apathy, that is an argument for like having campaigns in general, ladies and gentlemen, not just a specific type of campaign. You don't need an emotional campaign to fix apathy. You can engage people with logic and facts. Like we saw this on the Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, which was fact-based and convinced a lot of people that climate change was something you should sit up and pay attention to. They point you to Michael Moore's videos, which have engaged hundreds of millions of Americans in a very intelligent way on a deep level. They point you to examples like Super Size Me. These are ways of fixing apathy that don't insult your audience and get real people who can convince change to fix this. Moving on to the second point about which is the types of support that organizations need. We're telling you today that by focusing on like, like focusing on the individual is, necess is like necessarily the wrong thing to do. Why did the opposition tell you you should focus on the individual? They said that when people are like, you know, interested in like Coney 2012, they'll go into Wikipedia and find out a bit more. That was the entire problem with Coney 2012, right? Because the minute someone like, you know, went and did a bit more research, they found that their campaign was an absolute sham and that they didn't know what the hell they were talking about. It absolutely discredited these campaigns and hurt invisible children far more than like a logical, rational and well-researched campaign would have. We think that when you concentrate on logical and fact-based campaigns that are like widely dispersed, it helps two main in two main areas. We think we think some like organizations like Invisible Children and Amnesty International need two things that individuals can't necessarily provide. They need firstly large amounts of cash and large amounts of funds. And secondly, they need structural changes. How do you best get large amounts of cash? It isn't like by mum and dad and like, you know, everyone on Facebook like chipping in a dollar here or there for your campaign. Because like the fact of the matter is, if you like like target your campaign at philanthropic people like George Soros from the UK, you can get like, you know, entire like huge amounts of money, like like in like uh, donated in ten minutes, more than you could get the entire Australian population to donate over the course of a year. 
That is why you should focus on corporations and like philanthropic people with interest because you get this like vast amount of funds at your disposal right now. The second reason we think you should focus on like they need structural change, this is what these organizations want. Like when you're asking for intervention in Uganda, you need governments on side. And we think this happens like when it doesn't mean that like, governments are going to deba debate themselves into an action, which is what they wanted. Like, I point you to the example of the Human Rights Watch, which has got like real action in Somalia and in Kenya. And this is not done by debating themselves into an action. Debating is great, but they also want policy change, and they get it. The idea that like, sometimes it's a disjunct between the population and what the population supports and what the government actually does is a really real and important disjunct. It's not true to say that just because the entire population wants something to happen, the government will just like follow and run in tow. Like the point you, they told you the example of Libya that just happened because American pressured their government. Not true, ladies and gentlemen. If the US hadn't already had interest and wasn't always trending to go into Libya at the first place, if their population just told them to, they probably wouldn't have anyway. So moving on to this third point about even if these campaigns work, why it's a really bad thing that they do. Now this is taking the opposition's case at their best. Because they told you that the kinds, like we, we premised this, this debate today, that the kinds of solutions that emotional and simplistic campaigns give you are necessarily seem to be like really over dramatic. Like let's get Americans into Uganda, and like all these like children will be saved, and like the world will be like a really happy place with like rainbows and sunshine. Like this is a really simplistic solution, and I use it because it sounds great and it appeals to your emotions, ladies and gentlemen. It's like seen as a stopgap and can fix everything. The problem with presenting this solution is that organisations can't critique their own solution. They can't constantly revise it and create a debate about what is the best type of solution because they're giving you this like really flashy one size fits all approach and therefore support X, Y, and Z and the world will be all happy. We think that like even if we presume that the populace will be like overwhelmingly in support of campaigns like Pony 2012, which we don't think they are anymore, and even if this leads to government change, which we don't think it actually will, let's take the opposition's case like on these two premises at the best. But what we think will happen is actually a really bad time of change, but the government acts on <coughs> ill-thought-out solutions. Mm -hmm. When solutions happen, like, you know, let's put some American peacekeepers into Uganda, you get bad times of change, and it will necessarily backfire. It has two important consequences. It means governments are less likely to listen to these campaigns in future, and the populace are less likely to like, be involved when they see that their support has gone to something that isn't worthwhile. Ladies and gentlemen, we support the intelligent side of this debate, and, un and like, unsurprisingly, intelligent campaigns we beg to oppose. solve the crisis or give that awareness. They actually incite people to go and figure out 
what is happening in the world as it is. How do they do that? Because they show these emotive images in which people are like, there are child soldiers, who are like, there are children who are being created to be child soldiers. There are all these issues happening. I'm going to research this further and actually figure out what the hell I'm talking about. That is why there is a ratio of like 1 to 15 in which like one person will repost the Tony video without any comment and 15 people will post counter-criticism arguments saying, oh no, he has now left Uganda, he has now gone to the Congo, etc, etc, etc. That is where the awareness sweeps down into the rest of the population and that is what we think is good. So let's go through one by one the, uh, like the reasons that Beatrice gave us as to why these are mutually exclusive. First of all, she said that the style of emotion is narrative. So she said it looked towards the fact of like one victim and case studies and ultimately it could not give a context. First of all, they gave us no reason as to why, like, Coney is also, like, emblematic of other, of other campaigns of that, right? So she gave us no reason as to why you could not incorporate, uh, like, within, within the narrative, the fact that, oh, this bad guy Coney has now moved to the Democratic Republic of Congo and we should also pursue that there. Like, they never actually illustrated why that's a problem. But secondly, we would say that this is not a bad thing, because the fact of the matter is, is that the vast majority of people are not going to go and sit down and watch a two-hour documentary that does not have a narrative, that does not pull in the heartstrings. The fact of the matter is, is, like, I can about you, all the statistics that I like are saying that you know five billion people live below the poverty line on less than one dollar a day. You don't really care, right? It is when you see an emotive, emotive image of a starving child that you are then incensed to go to action, and that is what these things do. So we are happy that it is a narrative because that is what actually that is how the human psyche works, and that is how you get people to be involved and to actually care about this. We were then told that there's a limited airtime because there's only one campaign. This like empirically flies in the face of the fact that the invisible children are actually about to release a new video because there has been so much of an incense in which people have said your first video was simplistic but we are interested in what this is about that they are releasing a longer video that has more nuanced campaign that actually use a lot of international relations experts that, 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 the, affirmative, or that the negative wanted to hang their hat on. So therefore, into this idea about wanting to hire IR experts, the fact of, like, experts, the fact of the matter is, is like IR expert, experts are boring to the majority of the population. Like they are very, very boring, and no one cares about it, right? <laughs> what is less boring is like an exportable narrative that allows people to actually understand what is going on. Because again, we do not think it's like good enough to actually have this elitist notion in which you say that, wow, someone is someone is like not of a certain intelligence, or someone does not care about international relations when it comes to statistics. Therefore, they should not know what the world is about. Therefore, they should not know what's happening in, 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 in Africa. Therefore, they should not be involved in this political process. We don't think that's good enough to actually just have this elitist approach in today's debate. We were then told like this, this bizarre analysis, which is that you don't need an emotional campaign to influence apathy. The fact of the matter is, this completely overlooked all the analysis which Felix set up for you at first, which is that there are two factors which actually influence someone's apathy, right? First of all, the fact that someone can feel as, as, as an individual, they can do something. And that is exactly what these, these campaigns do. The fact of the matter is, is again, like a lot of people in, in Western like, developed countries will not go and donate money to Africa because they will say that the, the scale of the, the, the problems in Africa are to such an extent, to such a large scale, that their $100 is not going to make a difference. What these videos do is that they target the individual by saying, by doing X, by doing Y, by doing Z, you are making a difference. This is what you can do. So that is the stuff which we would like to hear a response to. Secondly, it also reduces the proximity. So like, yeah, an another fact of like ethics is that people feel worse if they are witnessing something that is close to them. At the moment, the reason why people can distance themselves from the problems in Africa is because they feel that it's too far away. Why do these social media campaigns work? Because they actually bring the, bring the world together on a much more prox like proximal scale in which they say, we are working together as one nation, like as one international community. We are like in proximity and we can work with this. So what are the benefits of fact-based campaigns? We were told that ultimately like, Ultimately, they had like a large, large amount of cash and funds. First of all, we would totally dispute this. Second of all, we would say that philanthropist don donations are also not mutually exclusive, so you can also have that. But thirdly, we would point to the example of Obama in 2008, who had one of the like, go, who had one of the largest contributions in terms in terms of campaign value, and that was constituted by small donations, right? And once again, we would say that is a really a really detrimental thing to say to the little guy: No, your money does not matter. No, your one hundred dollars does not matter. We are only relying on the on the philanthropist on the be people with that. We were then told the best case scenario why this is bad, that ultimately like organisations can't critique their own solutions. Yes, that is true, but the general public can critique their own solutions and other organisations can critique their solutions and governments can critique their solutions. What happens when you want like an ultimate and like when you want more people to be able to critique these solutions? You have more people knowing about the issue, you have more people involved in a political discussion. 
Also, they, they fail to understand, they, they fail to engage with all our analysis about the fact that like more awareness, even if it is simplistic, even if it is not at the high nuance level, is still better awareness. So the fact of the matter is, is like a government is not going to implement a policy based on a 27 minute video about, about Uganda or about Democratic Republic of Congo. The government is going to like to base it on public awareness, but also on their own, on, on their own more sophisticated knowledge. The fact of the matter is, is we don't think that it's a high burden to have to say that the entire populace has to have that like that amount of sophisticated knowledge because they're not the ones who are actually enacting this change. So today I'm going to talk to you about the fact how this actually means that like without without these sort of awareness programs, it means that the wealthy have a, like have a monopoly on these sort of issues and how and how policy is actually swayed according to this. Why is this the case? This is because like under the negative's very own characterization, it is generally the like the more wealthy people of society, those in higher brackets of SES, who are engaged in these issues. Why is that? Because they are more educated, because they have access to these sort of resources, because they are friends with Will Jones on Facebook. So what does this mean? It means that ultimately, like a lot of these people who are in the wealthy, who do have access to this education and to this knowledge, have the monopoly, have the monopoly on how these policies are implemented. We only look to the fact that, like in America, how the Jewish populace has like, a very, very, very large sway in, in like dominating policy on Israel and Palestine because they are they are like one of the wealthy populations that is also one of the most intelligent populations that is able to have disproportionate influence on this. So how does this actually help? What does this actually do? By providing a wider awareness of more people, albeit an imperfect awareness, it is still more people that are engaged in this political process. It is still more people that are engaged in this discussion. And ultimately, it is still more people that are ultimately swaying this democratic vote and being able to give this political capital. The negative wanted to poo-poo this idea of like, oh, ultimately it really doesn't matter. Governments will act upon their own accord. It doesn't matter how people act. We don't think that's how political capital works, right? Like we don't think we think that like if more people in a certain populace are, 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 are pressing towards a more an issue more powerfully, then the government is more incensed to do something about it. So what did we tell you today? We told you that imperfect awareness is far better than no awareness at all. We are very proud to oppose. <laughs> Very, very 
very quickly after that video was released and promptly stomped all over by the community. We give you on our side real supporters. They are a smaller group of people. True that. However, those people are going to be in it for the long haul. They're going to be in it, they're going to be lobbying governments. They're going to be showing up to offices of MPs and talking about these issues and about why Australia or the United States should adopt these policies and do what the Invisible Children charity want them to do. They're the ones who are going to be calling up like charities or other, sorry, other corporate donors and philanthropists and actually getting the donations that are meaningful for these people. We think that's incredibly important because at no point do they do more on their side than just prove they engage more people in the issue. At no point do they actually give us a reason why more people led to better change. So let's talk about why it doesn't. There are a couple of reasons. First of all, we told you that in general this support doesn't last for a very long time. So to the extent that the Australian government or the United States government might have stopped and listened to Coney 2012 for the month in which it was actually a thing, that died down very quickly. You're very unlikely to actually influence government policy in one month's time. You are very unlikely to get the United States government to agree to massive things in one month's time. You need that charity to operate and be actually successful for a longer period of that. So just having a huge flashpoint of support doesn't get you those outcomes. But secondly, we think that it is incredibly important to have financial support over a long period of time. First analysis there, plenty of people who donated to Coney 2012 have asked for refunds subsequent to other videos being released and then actually finding out how much of a fast Coney 2012 was. So we think the type of supporters you actually need to engage to get meaningful change are not the types of supporters they engage. So let's talk why, about why we do engage those supporters. We think it is untrue that general philanthropists will just give over money willy-nilly. We think that big philanthropists who have billions of dollars at their disposal have a number of choices about what charity to give money to. And they need to be convinced that your charity is the place that most deserves that money. And also that their money is going to be most effective in your charity. The way to convince them of that is to prove that your solution is actually realistic, that your solution is going to be meaningful, that your solution is actually going to change the lives of people in Uganda or in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In order for you to prove that to those philanthropists, you need to actually give them facts about what your solution is, about how it will operate on the ground, about what the alternative solutions are and why those things are less good and why your thing should be prioritised. You cannot do that in a video that focuses entirely on emotion or in a campaign that focuses focuses entirely on emotion. Secondarily, governments are not swayed by emotion. The United States government isn't going to go into Uganda on the basis that people are very, very angry about a particular issue. They're going to go in on the basis that that policy will work and will not backfire. So that leads me to the second part, really, of this debate, which is let's take them at their best. Let's assume that the populace actually does affect change in the government. Let's assume that they rely upon all that money and really invisible children get exactly what they want. Why is that a really huge problem in this debate? Because those solutions that are proposed in an emotive campaign are very one-dimensional. They do not canvas a range of options because it's too hard, according to them, for people to understand the complexity of these issues. We think it is so problematic for any government anywhere to implement serious changes in their foreign policy without engaging in the complexity of these issues. We think to the extent that they could prove that populists would push their governments to do things. We think they're going to push their governments to do things that are wrong. Let's talk about why that is incredibly problematic. Because when those solutions backfire, because when the government actually adopts that policy and they do that policy, and that policy turns out to have been really ill thought out and not all that effective, that changes the way that government is going to behave in the future. It means that government is going to be less likely to listen to that same group of people or to that populace. But also we think it changes the way the, in the interaction between the populace and these types of campaigns. It makes them incredibly sceptical about supporting this charity or about supporting any of these types of campaigns in the future because they did it once and they were burned. We think it means that you are less likely to even get the initial flair of support that that team was so reliant upon. Which means to the extent they could affect change at all, it was only ever going to be in the short term. It was only ever going to be now. It was never going to be a significant long-term change. And that's really problematic, given the types of issues we're trying to target here are actually very complex changes that take a very long time to be actioned. They require governments to commit to not just doing something this year, but commit to doing something over a period of 10 years, or over a period of 20 years. They require governments to have consistent support to continue funding and continue propagating these particular policies. We think, therefore, at the best case scenario for them, they can guarantee you something in the short term which possibly might work, but was most likely to fail.
on the other hand, the negative team gave you this. We gave you that when you engage in an academic discussion, which we think incidentally people are capable of doing, you get real policy options debated and put on the table. You get real decisions about what is the best thing for the countries that we're talking about. Those policies eventually get implemented. We are happy to concede that they might take a little bit longer. We think when you're talking about invading a country, length of time is sometimes a good thing because you want to make sure that policy is actually going to work and actually going to do the thing you're aiming to do. We think we will get you those long-term changes. Just like an inconvenient truth forced governments all over the world to engage with the reality of climate change, to talk about solutions, because it canvassed the problem, because it gave you real, actual options that governments could adopt. We can see in this debate, everyone, that we do not get everybody on board. We say we don't need all of you in this room to think Cody is a bad guy. We say we need governments to think he is such a bad guy that the solution provided is going to work. And they're the ones that ultimately go and affect change, and it's not you and I. We're very happy to stand by them. The academic, logical discussion that the opposition wanted to hang their hat on tonight was mo were movies such as Super Size Me, in which a man eats so much McDonald's he vomits in a car park. This sort of analysis, in which the only two examples they could give us of rational discourse that actually captured the public's imagination or actually led to change, were Al Gore, who stood on like an elevating level to show like how climate change is increasing, and like Super Size Me, which was just a man getting fat, shows the logical discussion doesn't affect change, and shows that this was always going to fall on our side of the house. So in regards to this, I'm going to ask two big, meaty questions. Firstly, what sort of awareness is necessary when we're talking about changing world issues? And secondly, how does this awareness actually lead to on the ground change in policy, both in the short and the long term? So firstly to this question of what sort of awareness is necessary in changing world issues. We heard right from the beginning of the opposition's case that facts and emotions are mutually exclusive. Beatrice gave you a number of reasons why this was true. Firstly, she told us the style of emotion, like style, was emotionally narrative. We thought that that doesn't mean it's ne necessarily unfactual that Jacob experienced a narrative in which he was forced to shoot his parents, join a child's army, and shoot others. We think that that's not a, like a narrative that is untrue, nor which is a narrative that is unrepresentative of what is actually happening in Uganda. If the public can best emote with that narrative on a one-on-one -on -one basis, they are more likely to engage in the way that they are more likely to engage in Al Gore telling them individually how climate change will affect them. We think that that's an accurate way to combine facts and um, like emotions. She then told us like, that there are limited time restraints on movies like Coney. We don't think, unlike Beatrice, that you need to know decades of histories of Ugandan like, culture and like, their influence with various regions to know that currently there is a man named Coney who is systematically gathering children to form a child army. We don't think you need to know the history of Uganda to understand that, because the IWC has been able to look at the history of Kony, of Uganda. The people who are like actually structuring the campaign, who are the people able to structure letters into like, part, like government, who are able to structure real responses, do know the history of Uganda. What we need public support for is to actually get those issues to the fore so they can be discussed, so they can be evaluated, and so they can affect real change. Then finally she told us about like showmen versus international relations experts. Kaylin already told you about how boring international relations are, <coughs> but moreover we tell you, like point to instances such as the photo from Vietnam where a girl covered in napalm ran screaming and crying through the streets of Vietnam, and how was that was the most effective change in the public discourse and the public approach to Vietnam, and how that is representative of how short but emotive things can actually capture not just the emotional heartstrings, but the factual heartstrings of what they represent. People are able to read in to emotions to deliver factual outcomes, and that's what we're happy to defend. So then, the question becomes, regardless of whether facts and emotions are mutually exclusive, even if we lose that, can fact-based campaigns actually challenge, like, apathy? So Beatrice told us that, like, um, they can, like, people are able to engage with logic and fact. It is great that Monash debaters love like logic and fact, but we don't think that that is representative of like the white public who doesn't like watching Q and A, who would prefer to watch like Geordie Shaw at night time. We think that that doesn't make them stupid. It makes them feel like it is 
representative of the fact that in our media, which is not no longer just representative papers, but is also blogs, is also like individuals sprouting their own political beliefs all over the place, left, right and centre, that they feel overwhelmed and like unable to change. We'd also point, as I said in my introductions, to the examples they told us about what was logical and informative campaigns. We don't think Super Size Me or Michael Moore documentaries, which obviously do play on things like humour and emotion to make those issues seem really important, uh, is a bad thing. We, th like, we think that that is admitting that there are no sort of like examples they could point to where it is purely logical and reason-based and effective. Because of that, we don't think that like ch uh, purely logic-based um, campaigns can challenge apathy. So therefore, becomes the question of, do you need widespread change in awareness, or is it sufficient to have change in awareness of just like intellectuals in society? So in second, Gemma acknowledged that the most important like stakeholders in, in like in providing change for in, uh, organizations were their hardcore supporters. We point to the fact that hardcore supporters are engaged in that because of the emotional response they have to the issue. We say that hardcore supporters happen when you know about Cody, you then research yourself about Cody, and then you perhaps go to Uganda and see what's happening with Cody like in person. That's the sort of like flow on of levels that engage hardcore supporters. She then wanted to tell us about how the Cody video has waned in support. We think that since every single person in this room knows about Coney when they didn't before, that even if that support wanes a little, it is still a lot of more supporters now than it was before the video was released. Um, so now to this question of how does that then, if we acknowledge that awareness is important when we're talking about actually changing things, and we acknowledge that widespread um, like public support is important, how does that then affect policy on the ground? The opposition wanted to tell us a lot about the fact that like invisible children don't put all their funds into like on the ground services. It's not really my thing, but I'm happy to do the maths. Like kind of, what you have to look at is the fact that if 23% of invisible children's like funding has always gone to things on the ground in Uganda, that 23% is going to be larger when millions of people are donating to like the Coney campaign versus like a fraction of society who are like pseudo intellectuals care about that issue. At second, Gemma was like poo pooing the fact that like the second Coney video should have been released first. If that is the worst case scenario, that you have to watch a, like a great piece of film and then have that backed up by a second video that they were happy to support, then that's like a worst case scenario that we're pretty happy to stand by in this debate. We think that private organisations are allowed to determine strategy in the way that best services their needs and wants. So then, kindly, the opposition gave us two examples, like a couple of examples of how a charity can be affected. Firstly, Beatrice told us that they need large amounts of cash. Caitlin already told you the example of the Obama campaign where most of the donations were five to ten dollars, but that that money was equally important when we're talking about actually amassing cash. Secondly, Gemma wanted to hang her hat on philanthropists. Caitlin already told you why that sort of approach is dangerous because philanthropists, because they come from a certain social.